All right, guys. Thursday, uh, March 17th, Zillow Flex Training. Let's kick this thing off. On today's agenda, we're going to be going over some of our coaching notes from our growth advisor. We meet with our growth advisor every Wednesday, which is Andrew, the guy that came to our presentation. So we met with him yesterday uh, just to kind of go over some feedback from the last week. So we'll be going over that, um, some updates. Um, we'll see if anybody wants to get certified. Is there anybody trying to get certified today for Flex? Let's maybe start there. And if we can get everyone's camera on, so I know who I'm talking to, I know who's paying attention. There we go. There we go. Cameras on, please. There we go. There we go. Um, all right, let's kick it off. Let me share my screen. Actually, before I start, um, before I share my screen, I just kind of wanted to go over just some discussion that we had with our growth advisor. As we continue to add agents onto Flex and you know continue to move forward with Flex, we're gonna have to start really, really cracking down on you know whether or not people are following the process or not, whether or not people are converting because it's kind of all over the place right now. We have some people that are really running with flex and treating it really seriously and tracking their numbers and updating statuses. And we have some people who are not. And, you know, so I'm trying to say this in the most positive way possible, but there's going to have to be a standard that we, you know, follow. And, you know, through that, if you're not meeting the standard, then some people are going to have to be taken off of flex just because it's imperative that everyone is performing at a certain level in order to keep the account going. Um, Zillow Flex is a powerful, powerful um, lead source that can, you know, really help you jumpstart your business and help you, you know, close deals and meet clients and stuff like that. And it can be a, you know, a pillar of your business if, if you play your cards right. Um, but it's also a, uh, it's also a privilege and it's also a program that is based strictly off performance. So as we had that meeting with uh, Andrew who came into the office, he talked about who's good for flex, who's not good for flex, um, you know, who the ideal candidate is. And, you know, one of the things that he mentioned is not all agents are good for Zillow flex. You guys remember him saying that, right? Strictly because it's not one of those things where we're paying for these leads and they don't care whether we close a deal or not. It's strictly based off performance. You know, I've, we've said this before and Andrew said that Zillow is saying, hey, we're going to give you X amount of leads. We're not charging you anything up front when we could be giving these leads to another agent who's going to pay up front. We're going to give these to you guys and you need to convert these at a certain level you know, and, and you pay on the back end basically, right? So if we're not meeting our end of the bargain, then they can take our flex account away. So what does that mean? That means, you know, that message needs to be trickled down and we need to really, really buckle down on if you're going to be part of flex, you're going to take it seriously and you're really going to honor your end of the commitment. Zillow's commitment is to give us the leads and the opportunity and to set up the infrastructure and, you know, to spend all their millions of dollars marketing and getting people to visit their site. But our end of the bargain is that we're going to handle these leads efficiently. We're going to update the statuses. We're going to report back to them. We're going to do everything we can to convert these. That's our end of the bargain, right? So, cause it's a partnership at the end of the day. So as we continue to go forward, um, you know, there will be, unfortunately probably be some cuts made or maybe pausing some people until they can get their numbers up and things of that sort. So we'll just want to put that out there. And if you're doing a great job, you know, with flex, it's also an opportunity for you to share what's working with the rest of the team, right? Because it's a moving target. A lot of times, right? We have things like the market, you know, you know, changes the competitiveness of the market. You know, we have clients that you're, you're dealing with a lot of different variables with flex. So if someone is having a lot of success, the best way that everyone else is going to have success is by modeling what that person is doing, right? So we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit more. Um, so what I'm going to pull up is
some of our coaching notes here. Um, so some things that will apply to us. Um, a big thing here, guys, is that our campaign, um, it goes by quarters, right? So it's a quarterly campaign. So every three months, you know, they give a certain amount of leads. They project, you know, which, how many leads they're going to give us. And there's a report card at the end of that three months on how we performed with those leads. So that's coming up um, in April. So basically the last day for us to put a deal in contract for Flex is March 31st, which is basically another, you know, half, we're halfway through the month. We've got another two weeks, you know, to push as many deals into uh, Flex. And that's on April 1st, they're gonna take a snapshot of what our conversion rate was for the last three months. And from there, that's how they determine whether they increase our leads, whether they decrease, whether they maintain, you know, that's where they give us our score. You know, having three consecutive quarters of bad scores, that's when you get kicked off. If, you know, if you have one bad month, bad quarter, you know, you still have time to, you know, catch back up. But it's something where we always want to stay ahead and keep that score up. So if you're working on anything right now, uh, for any flex clients, just know that March 31st is the last day to get them in contract for it to count for this quarter. So we, we got to make these pushes, you know, I know some of you guys have stuff that's pending. You guys are writing offers. You guys are showing homes, but let's really, really, really push because it's, this is really where the, the report card comes in and it will determine how we go uh, into the next quarter. Now, why is that important? It's important because as we get more agents coming on flex, we want to have a good volume of leads, right? You know, if, if Zillow is giving us 200 leads and we have 20 agents, that's about 10 leads per agent. But now if we have 30 agents and we're not performing and they're only giving us 200, right? It affects everybody. So we want to have a good flow of leads, right? So that's where we're going to have to also see who's getting the leads and what are they doing with them? Because let's say, for example, um, Alfredo's getting, you know, 15 leads a month. And he's constantly booking appointments and he's getting stuff in contract and he's performing well and someone else is getting 15 leads and they're not getting anything in contract. We got to decide as a team, like that person who's, you know, performing is, should be getting more opportunity. The person who's not performing should be pulled back, right. Or be coached, or maybe we got to, you know, really evaluate what they're doing. So it's an individual uh, measurement, right? Everyone's individual uh, conversion rates and all that stuff applies, but it all adds up together to give us our team score and our team score is what they base it on. So, any questions on that, guys? If you have any questions throughout this, feel free to just type it in the chat as well and I can address these. Um. So one thing we're going to talk about today, guys, is offer velocity. Um, submitting offers rate is where agents need to focus on, right? We need to focus on, we meet with the client today, right? We get that lead today. We go meet them and show them a property. How quickly can we get them to submit offers on properties, right? That's really where it's crucial, right? That part of the, of the process is crucial because when you have someone while they're hot, hot, right, they finally decided to click on a property and get connected to a Zillow premier agent. They go see this property. Like that's when they're excited the most. That's when they're most likely to buy, right? If they go back home and now you can't get a hold of them or now like that one property they thought they liked, it's not available. What happens to the motivation of that client, right? It starts to drop. So this is where things like having multiple properties that we're going to show them is important, right? We don't want to just go out there and show them this one property because the chances of them getting that one property, what are the chances of someone getting that first property they see? Slim. Very, very slim. So if we know that, if we know that's the nature of the market, we need to already be thinking five steps ahead of the client, right? We need to know that when I go show them this property, there's a good chance they may not even get this property. You know, 
for multiple reasons, the competitiveness of the market, or once they see it, you know, the pictures look great online, but then you go see a property, it could be a whole different story. You know, photo editing is, is really, uh, really high right now, right? Like people can make properties look great on video and photo, and then you see them and then you either like it or you don't like it, right? So we need to already know that going in and we need to be prepared for that by going in there with multiple options for properties. It's just like, I use the Foot Locker analogy, right? Like, has anybody ever went and bought a pair of shoes? You go ask for a size 10 in, in these Jordans or whatever shoes or a women's shoe or whatever. And they say, oh, okay, let me go check if I have that. What happens when they don't have that and they come back out? What do they normally do? No one has it, but we have options. Yep. Mauricio said, they go in the back, they're looking for that size, whatever. They don't have it in the black shoes that you were looking for. But what they do is they come back out with four other pairs, right? Well, you know what? I don't have I don't have those in black, but I have them in blue. Actually, these blue ones are pretty tight. They would look pretty good with your outfit, right? They start selling you on why you should get the blue ones because they got those in your size, right? You know, or they have a something that's similar, right? Hey, I don't have those ones, but I got these other ones that are really similar. They just have a little stripe on the side. But I, these are these are pretty popular right now, too. And I think these, you know, these look like they go with your outfit, whatever. Right. That's what they're trying to do. It's the same concept when you're out there showing someone homes. Right. You may go show them that home. And if you ask the right questions on the initial call, you're going to know what they're looking for. Right. So you want to go there already knowing that you're probably not going to have their size shoe available. Right. We're using that analogy. You're not going to have their size shoe available. So you need to come with a different, another size, right? Or another shoe in the same size, or maybe it's a, it's a size eight and they wanted a size seven, but you got the little filler that goes in, you know, Hey, if you just put a filler in there, you'll be good. Right? Like that's what, that's what they try to do to you. Right. When you go to the shoe store. So they try to make it work, right? They try to figure out a way to make it work. And that's the way it is in the market right now is because it's so competitive. Buyers are going to have to compromise, right? They may love that property. But guess what? 30 other offers love that property too, right? So you're competing with 30 people and they're going to go 500 grand over asking. But you know what? There's this other one down the street. It's coming soon. I know the listing agent. We can probably see it before it goes on the market. And if you like it, we could put an offer. In. And if that one doesn't work, I have this other one too, right? Like this is where now you guys got to come prepared with multiple options for these clients because we talked about offer velocity, right? You want to get these clients from lead Initial lead to offer, submitting an offer as quickly as possible. Like that time frame needs to shorten. If you meet with someone today and you're not getting them to write an offer for two months, like the probability of you even staying in touch with them that long to get them the right offers, like it, it doesn't usually happen, right? It's usually within that first few weeks, like that's when everyone's hot, right? So you got to strike while you're hot. Strike while the iron's hot. That's what they say, right? Um, any questions or feedback on this? Anybody think this is difficult? Like, is it difficult for you guys to do this? Is anybody like, okay, well, that makes sense. Or no, you know what? Yeah, sounds great, Enrique. But, you know, it's kind of hard with the market right now. Or give me some feedback. Someone unmute themselves and give me some real life feedback. For me, if I could go, uh, that's what approach that I'm definitely taking, like with my more recent leads, our first conversation is like, oh, okay, so this is something you'd want to write an offer on. Like I planted that seed. So when we went to look at it and I, you know, followed, would you see yourself living here? They actually did want to write an offer. They were short, sadly, you know, by 40,000, they went from wanting to spend 760 up to 820. But when they countered 860, they just weren't going to do that. But so I do appreciate you giving us those tips and me implementing it. Yeah. There you go. Right. So Diana is already planting the seed from the beginning. Right. That's the adjustment that she made. Right. Of Hey, would, can you see yourself living in this property? Right. We need to be having those conversations when we're in the showing of like getting inching them to the sale to writing an offer. Hey, can you see yourself living here? Yeah, I can. But, you know, I don't really like the backyard. Yeah. You know what? The backyard probably needs a little bit of work, but does it meet the rest of your, you know, your checklist? Yeah, it does. You know, but my concern is the backyard. Well, hey, you know what? I got a really good landscaper. 
you know, based on my experience, if you just put a little bit of sod right here, did some grass, put some plants, you might spend 5,000 bucks, but now you fix this backyard. So it'll look great. And now it meets all your, all your things. Do you think that would make sense? You think you, you know, you can work with that? Actually, I never thought about that. Right. And now you went from someone already disqualifying the property to now you created the vision of like, Hey, we can make this happen. And they're like, all right, well, yeah, that makes sense. That's not, a, that's not a big deal. Because remember, sometimes mm. clients, <laughs> that's a long sigh. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes clients, right? Like we're the experts, right? If we've been in this game, we know more or less what it costs to paint or to do a yard or to do a kitchen. And if you don't know, you need to get educated on that really fast because chances are when you go show a property, it's not going to meet everything that the client needs. It may need a new paint job. How much does it cost to paint the inside and outside of a 1500 square foot house? Interior and exterior. Six grand. What was that? Yeah, like six grand, seven grand. Interior and exterior? Now you're looking more around 12 grand. There you go. 1,500 square feet, full paint out, baseboards, ceilings, walls, inside and exterior, inside out, gutters, right? Like if a full Keep paint it. job, 10,000 10, bucks, maybe 10, maybe 12, right? It's going to vary, but it's safe to say maybe 10 grand, 12 grand if you want a full, full entire paint out, right? If it's just paint the walls and don't touch anything else and you start, you know, shaving some money off. But you should know more or less what the range is for these things because someone, you go show them this home and it's orange and they don't like the color and then, yeah, I don't like this home. Well, what if it was gray with white? Would you like it? Yeah, actually I would. Well, you know, that only probably costs about 10 grand to do the whole entire paint inside and out. I have a really good painter actually that we work with. You know, now you're, now you're figuring out ways to make it work and to get them to the offer table a lot faster instead of, you know, taking the, you're taking a proactive approach, right. Instead of trying to push them to the finish line, instead of saying, okay, well, yeah, that color is ugly. Let's wait and see if something else pops up. If you're doing that, it's cool. If you're doing that, right. Cause now you're getting training on why not to do that. Right. Everyone starts somewhere. Some people don't know yet, right? But you need to be the person that is creating solutions for people. When you go meet with them, you need to be giving that value of, hey, I'm connected. I'm the guy you want to work with. I'm the girl you want to work with because I'm connected. I got lenders. I got landscapers. I got painters. You want to do, you want to knock this wall down? I got someone that can give you a quote, right? And we just did it for another client. It's probably going to run you about 30 grand to redo this whole entire kitchen, knock the wall down, make it super nice but you're going to love it. And it's going to be your dream home. And because it's, it needs a little remodeling, you'll probably get it for a better price than if it was already all fixed up, right? By you spending 30,000 to fix the kitchen, you might save a hundred thousand in the price because once someone fixes it all up and puts it on the market, now it's going to get bitted up because there's a lot more people going after this property. Like, like things like th this is what I would say to an actual client. And then they're like, damn, I never thought about it that way. I was only looking for things that were already remodeled. Well, yeah, those are great, but you're going to pay the most money for something that's all already remodeled. And it's not a dollar for dollar. Like if it costs 50 grand to remodel a house, you're not paying 50,000 more. If it costs 50 grand to remodel a house and someone pimped it out, you're going to pay like 200 grand more because the market's going to drive the price up. So if you're not having like these high level of conversations with your clients, you're not bringing a lot of value to the table, right? You need to be the one that studies this and knows this and gets familiar with, you want to think like how the client thinks, right? You want to be able to follow their logic and be able to provide solutions to these things. And that's where you're going to make yourself, yourself stand out, right? Um, I was on a mastermind the other day and they were talking about one of the things, this is Dan Beer, his team, he's a team leader and his team did 700 plus transactions last year, like over 600 million in volume. Um, he's actually the number one team in EXP. He said, a, he said an important thing that kind of uh, stood with me. He said, the MLS agent is dead today. The MLS agent. And what he meant by that is he meant the agent that just sets you up 
put the MLS search and says, yeah, let me know when you see something you like and they're waiting on something to come to them, those are the agents that are dying. They're, they're going to get phased out. The market is too competitive. There's a lot more agents coming in the game. People are getting their license every, every single day. We see that on our team, just on our team. Imagine out there, right? If you're just an MLS agent, where you're just opening doors and you're waiting for things to pop up and you're not doing all these extra things, you're going to die in this game. You're already dead. Like it's already happening, right? Like the old school agents who like aren't that aggressive and aren't don't have like off markets and don't have contractors and don't have all these different things to bring to the table. There very few of them are winning in this market. We also talk about inventory being low, right? Everyone's like, the inventory is low. The inventory is low. Is the inventory low? Yes or no? Yes. Compared to what? Are homes still being sold? Yeah. How many homes sold in 2021 versus 2020? I posted it the other day. There was 97,000 or something more homes that sold in 2021 than 2020. So inventory is low, I guess. But houses are being sold. In fact, we're selling a lot more houses than we were the previous years. What does inventory mean? What's available to sell now? Bam, Mauricio said it. Inventory means what's available on the market to sell now, right? We're in a market where homes don't stay on the market long. Homes are being listed every single day. They're just getting sold within three days, right? So that perception of like inventory is low, inventory is low. That's something that we're just really putting in our own minds. And the more we keep selling people that and keep saying that, like we're programming ourselves that it's too hard to make shit happen. Right. We're, that's what we're doing. So I want you guys to rephrase like inventory is low. It's like, no, homes are selling really fast. Right. The amount of homes that come on, there are a lot of homes coming on every single week, but they're going really quick, which means we need to move faster. Right. In fact, in 2021, almost 100,000 homes, more homes sold than in 2020, right? So homes are selling. The thing is, how are we gonna get you into this home? How are we gonna you know, understand how fast the market moves, which means we need to move fast, right? So we're talking about offer velocity, right? From when you meet with this client to when you get them to the offer table, we need to shorten that period up. We need to create that sense of urgency we need to have that 10 minute consultation in the driveway, right? You went and showed them this home. You told them about how, hey, the backyard's actually not that bad. Yeah, it looks ugly now, but you know, in two weeks, I'll make this thing look beautiful and it's gonna cost you 5,000 bucks. Now we go to the driveway because someone else is waiting to show the home. We gotta now put them up on game on, hey guys, this is what's happening in the market. We need to move quick. This one looks like it meets you know, seven out of the 10 things on your checklist, but we just talked about checking off two more boxes for 10,000 bucks. We'll paint the orange house, you know, for five grand and we'll do the backyard for five grand. Now it meets nine out of 10. I think we need to make an offer on this home. I already spoke to the listing agent because I'm already four steps ahead of you. I know offers are due on Monday, but we're going to submit an offer today within two hours because this is, you know, preemptive strategy. This is what I do. That's different than any other agent where most agents are waiting and they're the MLS agent where they're being told what to do. No, we're taking that proactive approach and we're going in aggressive right now. And I already got my contractors lined up. We can come out here and get you a formal bid. I think we need to move forward on this one. It's not going to last. What do you guys think? All right. So, you know, it's two right now. When you guys are hungry, go get some lunch, you know. Uh, let's meet up at three in my office or four and let's start getting the offer together. You see the difference between that and like, so what you guys think? Let me know if you let me know if you want me to get disclosures for you. Don't work that way, guys. Like this, we're that's not the market we're in right now. We don't have an abundance of homes. Like we're trying to like, if I got a size seven or a size eight, I'm selling that size seven or size eight, right? I'm gonna make make it enough, right? I'm gonna make it work. This is where your sales skills need to come in. This is where you guys got to push, right? Now, if the home clearly doesn't meet the client's needs, we're not trying to sell something that they're not going to be happy with, right? But if it's in the area, the size, the schools, and it needs a little bit of this and that here and there, 
and it checks off, you know, seven out of 10, yeah, I'm going to push. But if I clearly know this is not a good house for my client, I'm not trying to just sell them something they don't want. That Now you're being a scumbag, right? So that's not what I'm telling you to do, right? So just let's get that clear before someone starts. Enrique's telling us just to sell anything, right? No, it's not what I'm telling you. Yeah, I'm telling you that if it's within the parameters, there, there's going to be wiggle room and we all need to understand that there's compromise happening on these deals, right? And we need to, when we see that opportunity, we need to push and we need to take charge. And this is the difference between being a leader and leading the client to the finish line versus letting the client lead you and like you're bouncing all over the floor, right? And they're dragging you along. This is the difference, right? So I want to turn this over to Aaron. I want to Aaron. I want to talk to Aaron because we've been looking at Aaron's uh, numbers and progress and stuff. And it's one thing for me to say all this stuff. Like in theory, it all sounds great. And yeah, Enrique, you do a good job of selling it to us, you know. But this is actually happening right now, right? There's people on our team that are doing what I just said that are getting people to get in a lead and with two or three weeks, within two to three weeks, get an offer accepted, right? Um, so I want Aaron to kind of share that, the last one that you just got accepted, because I looked at that one, that was the $3.6 million, Aaron. Yep. I looked at, you got that lead on like February 22nd or something like that. And I think you had it in contract within like three weeks three or four weeks. I don't know. It, something around, something around that. It was within 30 days for sure mm -hmm. that you got it in contract. Is you that correct? Or am I, was I seeing a mistake? Yeah, I think it, I think it was three weeks. Uh, we only went out to see homes twice. Well, it was okay, the initial so, home that I, uh, I met them at and then uh, I took them out one more time. Okay. So I'm going to pin you and I'm going to pin myself because now I want to do a little interview for the sake of this training on you, maybe just walking me through, like maybe some of the mindset, maybe some of the initial dialogue, maybe some of the challenges, like how did you get these people from getting that lead to getting them in contract within three weeks for 3.6 million? Like walk me through the beginning, like let's spend some time. Cause I want everyone to see like how this game is, you know, supposed to be played. Sure. Um, so, you know, and initially on their, um, on the phone call, they did say that they had an agent. Like, you know, they it was just one specific house they really wanted to go look at. Um, they told me, she was like, Aaron, I want to be transparent with you, but I already have an agent. I don't want you to represent me. And I was like, okay, that's fine. And when someone says they have an agent, I always just want to know, like, I'm not going to fight them on it. Um, it's more just like, well, why isn't your agent helping you with this house? She was like, oh, he just lives far away. I was like, okay, that's fine. You know, I can go at least take you to the home and see if you like it. And in my mind, I was like, okay, I can at least go see a $4 million home. It'll make a cool Instagram video. <laughs> if anything, right at the end of the day, that's what it is. Um, I met them and I guess their agent lives in Danville. It was like a really nice family. Um, and Danville, he lived in the East Bay somewhere, San Ramon, that's what it was. <laughs> and so I just asked her if he competes, does he compete in the South Bay? You know, the markets are, are a little bit different from the East Bay to South Bay. And she was like, oh no, like he doesn't. Uh, I don't think he competes in the South Bay. I was like, okay, well, that's something to consider too. You know, you want to make sure that somebody knows the market here and they know how to get you in contract whenever you do find the right home. Um, yeah, I don't know. And then I, uh, there was some, some questions about like uh, their financing and everything. And uh, coming from the finance background, I was able to, to bring some value when I was with them. And just, just following up, I, I never fought them on like having a realtor. I was like, hey, like I can go ahead and, and give you the disclosures. I can give you the comparables. You know, you can ask your realtor for the comparables to at least see, um, you know, it's, it's get, 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 get both people's opinions on it. Um, and that way you guys can make the best decision for yourself. And I don't even think they hit up there with a realtor. <laughs> but I don't know that, okay, that so transaction is a little bit. Hmm? I want to stop you there, right? Because let's, let's break that down. The lot that you said right there, there's a few things, right? Number one is the client right off the gate, right out of the gate said, I have an agent. I just want to see this home. And, you know, I don't want you to represent me. I'm just letting you know up front, right? Two options, right? What most agents do is, ah, this is a bad lead, ah, right? Aaron was like, you know what? They want to see a $4 million property. I'm, I came, sh I showed up to work, 
dress, dress to impress, ready to go. It's going to make a cool Instagram video either way, right? And it's a potential to go meet a $4, $4 million buyer, right? And I'm going to go and I'm going to do what I do. And then I'm going to let the work speak for itself. Whereas a lot of agents would have already in their mind started disqualifying that lead and in the back of their mind saying, ah, this is not a good lead. Even though they may have went, they're already telling themselves, psyching themselves out, right? So right off the bat, what I want everyone to point out is that when you have an opportunity and you know someone's going to buy, and especially at a $4 million price point, you're going to go out there. You go out there, right? Like if you signed up for this business thinking anything's guaranteed, you're in the wrong business, right? Nothing's guaranteed in this business. You got to go out there and show value and you got to earn your commission, right? So I, I think that's just the mindset that everyone needs to have is that I'm just trying to set up the opportunity to get in front of them because I know when I'm in front of them, I bring so much value to the table that they're going to reconsider working with their agent, right? You don't want to bash another agent, right? Because if you bash another agent, that says more about you than it does about the agent, right? But what you want to do is you want to tell them what you do. And you want to ask questions, right? You can ask questions. There's a difference between saying, well, your agent's from the East Bay. He doesn't do business out here versus, hey, you know, does your agent do any business out here? You know, is he familiar with the market out here? There's a difference on how I said that, right? To where now they're like, well, actually, I don't think he does. And then boom, puts a little bit of doubt, you know. The, okay, the well, you know, that's, that's important. Go ahead. The last two listings that I've gotten signed off of Zillow Flex, both of them said they have agents. And the previous one that I have with Tony, his agent, he said was a good friend. So I don't think it's like a, a like an objection that really matters. And here's what, here's what I want you to think about, right? And I want you to, and also frame this when you're talking to clients and think about this in your mind is... If, if someone was going to quote you, let's say you were going to build a swimming pool in your backyard. That's a big investment, right? Build a swimming pool. Are you going to go get one quote? No. Let's say you have a boy that does swimming pools, but it's a, it's a, big, it's a big deal, right? To build a swimming pool. That's a big project. You're probably going to go get three quotes. You're going to compare. You're going to look at reviews and see who does the better job. And you're even going to tell your friend, like, hey, man, you're my boy, you know, and everything. But, you know, this I'm about to spend, you know, 70 to $100,000 on my backyard. I'm going to I'm going to get a couple comparisons. You know what I mean? And nothing against you. You're still going to be my friend, you know. So at the end of the day, like, that's what you got to tell the clients, too. Like, hey, I totally understand you have an agent. Remember, this is a huge investment. You're about to spend four million dollars. You know, like if you were going to build a swimming pool or if you were going to remodel your whole house, your whole house, you would probably get multiple quotes. Right. And kind of double check everything. Right. And then a client will go, oh, actually, yeah, you're right. Well, why am I thinking like only this agent can help? So sometimes like you don't want to like pigeonhole yourself to thinking like, oh, they said they have an agent. It's his friend. There's no way they're going to go with anybody else. Doesn't work that way. Aaron just proved it, right? Three different clients. They all said they had agents. So you just got to continue to move forward with the process, right? Don't let that be the knockout punch. That's not a knockout punch. That's an objection. You handle it and you keep moving on to the next phase of the process. Okay, so Aaron, you guys went and saw that house. What happened at the house? Was that the house that they ended up buying? It wasn't, no. They, um, at the house, we were going over their finances and how they can make it work for the specific house because it was like $700,000 over their budget. I think it was like a $4.2 million house. Um, so we were just going over like what they can do to make the house work if they wanted to, to go for it. And I had set an appointment for later that afternoon or the next day to meet with them. Um, yeah, and then um, they just decided it wasn't the right one for them. And then we just set up a time to go see another, like more houses the next week, I believe. Um, and then between then just, I don't know, they were out of town, just kept in, you know, kept in contact for a week. And then um, the next week they ended up not being able to see houses. I took them out the next week. And then that's whenever they, I think we just saw four houses and then they found one that they really liked. Um, it was, it so was like between that though, it was like setting them up on an automatic search. Um, and then Rob was telling me to like set them up on the automatic search and then pick out like a few properties that I think are going to stand out to them because the automatic search is so big. It doesn't, you can't really put everything that, you know, the client's going to want. Cause the client was very specific. 
So then set them up on the search so they at least get the email. So you're staying top of mind every day when they're getting that email from you. And then, um, you know, every few days or so, just go in there and pick out like the, the three or four houses that you know that they're really going to like and send that over to them. And then they were giving us feedback on the ones that we were picking out. And then, um, you know, each time they just like gave us feedback, it just like narrowed it down more and more to what they were wanting. So then the next time that we're going out, it's like, okay, well, these are the four houses that are fitting all the criteria for what you guys have been telling me over the last two weeks that you liked. Um, and out of those four that, you know, they got one of them. Okay, so there's a lot right there, right? There's a lot in what she did right there. Is number one is setting them up with an auto search. So bam, it's doing some work for you. It's sending them properties, but not just relying on the auto search thinking that's gonna do the job for you. This is the crucial, probably one of the most important things she did was she got an intimate knowledge by her discussion and her showing of the first property, an intimate knowledge of what they were looking for what their budget was because she talked about financing. So she knew what parameters they had to stay in. She probably knew what they liked, what they didn't like. So now she was able to look at that search and say, Hey, out of these, all these properties, I think these few probably are going to fit their needs instead of, you know, saying, here you go. Let me know which one you want to see. All right. She did a custom pick out of the ones that she was sending them and then contacted them and saying, Hey, these ones, I think we need to go see. All right. And then through that process of following up, they were able to narrow it down to like four properties, right? And that's the, I think the big difference between what a lot of agents do. We talked about how the MLS agent is dead, right? Just relying on the MLS to do the job for them. You got to go a step further, especially when you have a, you know, a luxury buyer like this, where someone spending $4 million is probably going to be a lot more pickier. There's certain things that are must haves, non-negotiables in that price point. Um, if they're going to spend that much, that, that much money. Okay. So Aaron, you narrowed it down to those four and did you guys go show those four and how'd you get them like to the offer table or at what point did you say, okay, we're making an offer on this one? Uh, it was actually three that I picked out. One of them they had picked out <laughs> and for the one they picked out, I was like, Hey, you guys, like based off of what you're telling me, it doesn't seem like this is going to be the great house for you. Like, you know, a, a house where I don't want to waste your time. Um, we can go see, it was like five bedroom and it was only like 2000 square feet or six bedroom and 2000 square feet. And they wanted big bedrooms. I was like, when you're looking at the square foot versus how, how many bedrooms there, it's probably going to be really small bedrooms. And then, uh, he was like, no, we should go see it anyways. And we went to go see it. And he was like, you're right, Aaron, the bedrooms are too small. So I think from there, he just trusted me. And then the last three, um, together, we just narrowed it down to which the, the two that he really liked. And then from there, he picked out of the two um the one that fit the best for him but when you're sending when you're sending um properties to people I think my biggest advice just to not waste your time and waste your client's time is to ask for the feedback whether it's things they like about it or things they don't like about it because it's going to help you pick properties in the future and then you know like Enrique was saying earlier like pictures and videos online are really misleading but as an agent um, it's easier to kind of take a look at those properties and, and see from those pictures that might look really nice to a, a client, what, what actually is wrong with it or what needs to be updated or how the lighting is and, you know, what's going to look like in real life. So the more feedback you're getting on what they like and don't like from the properties you're sending, then, you know, you won't waste your time later just sending them or even looking for things or sending them things that won't fit for them. Um, and then the client's going to trust you more, I think, because now, the more understanding you have of a client, the longer you're working with them, it, they're less likely to go somewhere else because you, you already know them, right? You already spent the time with them. They don't have to start all over with their preferences with someone else. Um, so I think that's important because a lot of times, especially at the beginning, I was sending properties and be like, oh, I just don't like that one. No, we can skip that one. But I wasn't knowing why they wanted to skip them. So now it's been really helpful just asking like, hey, what, what did you like or not like about that property? Why do you want to skip that property? Because um, even if it's just one sentence, like, hey, the driveway is small or whatever it may be, um, you know, for the next ones. So the, there's a lot, right? There's a lot in there too. One of the crucial things, I think, the important things that she pointed out was not being afraid to tell your client that this property is probably not going to be a good fit for them, right? Because I, I would think like $4 million client, they said they want to go see this one. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm excited. Let's go show them this property, right? Like now we're following them. But her like saying, hey, I'm here for the client, right? I'm here for the client because I'm trying to find them something that they're really going to want. And based off what we've talked about, 
they're not going to want this home. I already know the rooms are going to be small. It's only 2000 square feet with six bedrooms. Her telling the client that, even though the client said, well, let's go see it anyways. But when the client went and said like, Aaron, you were right. What did that prove to the client at that point? It proved that Aaron just wasn't trying to make a sale happen. It proved that Aaron was actually listening, you know, to their needs. And it just showed her value of, of her really trying to, you know, help them out and get them to, you know, where they want to be. Right. So I think from there, from there, you've built even more trust with them to now, to now where you recommend something. Now they're actually paying attention and listening to you. Right. And then now when you go to the next two, right, like you've throughout this whole process, this whole body of work that you've done, the trust and the trust and the trust is there to where now they're like, well, that other agent we were talking to, uh, he hasn't built this amount of trust with us. Yeah, we thought we were going to go with him, but Aaron did all this work and she proved that she's a great agent to work with. Okay, so let's talk about, and then we'll wrap this up. You guys write the offer. So you guys narrowed it down out of the two that you guys narrowed it down to, they decided they write an offer on one. And then what was the offer situation like? Did you guys compete? Um, tell me about that. We did compete. This was actually a, a really good experience between I think every party involved because my clients went back to see the house a second time to the open house. Um, Deliri was doing the pre-approval for them. Um, I was staying on top of the agent with our offer. At the end of the day, we were competing between one other offer. We came in at 3.625. The agent told me he had an all cash offer allegedly at 3.6251. <laughs> allegedly. <laughs> so we were competing against this all cash offer. At the end of the day, the agent um, gave it to us because he said that we showed a lot of excitement with the home. Um, so the owners were really excited to, you know, let, let my clients have the home. Um, he said delivery was really sharp on the phone whenever he was asking about, about their finances. Um, and then also when my clients went to the open house, he said that they remembered the wife being there because they were like taking measurements of things and asking a lot of questions to the agent. So he just remembered them from the open house being like really excited and serious about the home. Cause like the more excitement you show, I think it shows, the uh, like the sellers that you're less likely to back out. If you come off as like really eager, really excited, super happy to have this home. Like this is their dream home. I let the, the agent know when I was talking to him, like, Hey, you know, these, my clients are really busy. They're, you know, tech executives, CEO. Um, they really spent a lot of time the last few days to get everything in order to make this offer. They took a lot of time out of their day. Like this is their dream home. Um, you know, we want to do what it takes to get into this home. So like, let me know if we need to make an, um, a change on our offer. At the end of the day, we had to, he, he, he gave me that chance to, to change our offer to win the home. So, yeah. There we go. I think it was so, a, a whole team effort that was really good. So what, I, what I'm hearing, Aaron, is, you know, the dialogue with the listing agent, building that rapport with the listing agent. You already went out there, you know, to show the home. I'm, I'm assuming you guys spent a good amount of time in that home. And then the clients went out a second time, right? Showed their commitment, right? They're measuring and all that stuff. If a client's measuring rooms and stuff, that shows that they're serious, right? So the sellers are remembering that. And then having a strong lender on your side, right? Having Delary who I know in her process, she's probably calling the listing agent, selling the client, you know, selling, you know, the value of, of us all working together. Um, and then ultimately, right, it was the combination of all of those things that led to the listing agent saying, okay, I do have another offer, but I'm going to give you a chance to compete because I see you guys are way more committed and you got all your stuff together, basically at, at the end of the day, right? So if I'm going to have to put my money on who's going to close this deal, do I put my money on this cash offer who I maybe I've never talked to? Or do I put my money on this person who's done all these different steps and built all this value and, and credibility with me? And the clients look committed. They're measuring rooms and coming to the open house. And the lenders, really right? All those different things. Like, I'm going to put my money on this person. Because at the end of the day, the listing agent has a really high influence on who the buyer, I mean, who the seller ends up choosing, Right. If they want to push them this way, they'll push them this way when it comes down to push or shove and you're, you know, choosing between a couple of offers. So um, let's give it up for Aaron, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Let's go, Aaron. Thanks. Uh, 
I think Aaron, I just want to say great job, you know, um, even though, you know, you're, you haven't been in the game for a long time, but you've been in the, the business game and the servicing game and dealing with clients at a high level and all that stuff. And I think it, it shows that all those skills that you have already, you know, from your previous experience just rolls over easily into real estate. You're just selling a different product. But I, I think at the core, what makes Aaron great is, is a few things is, is her hard work ethic. Cause I know she's hustling. I know she's grinding. I know she's out there. We've gotten feedback from everyone on the team. I think it's the way that she handles herself and presents herself, right? She's always dressed, dressed great. She handles herself very professionally. When she speaks to someone, she speaks, you know, with authority. She speaks, you know, stuff like that, you know, and, you know, you're fun to hang around with too. Um, <laughs> At our potluck, right? <laughs> no, but um, that's never um, gonna be forgotten. No, but I mean, just it's all around, just all around great person, right? And then when she deals with her clients, she's putting the clients first, right? She's putting the clients' needs first, and regardless if the client has an agent or not, like when they start working with Aaron, they can see like that this agent is really here to help me, right? So it's the total package of all those things, and then the execution, right? Just making it all happen going out there, connecting all the dots and, and doing all that stuff. So um, good job, Aaron. This is, you know, we, you got to lead late February and in contract by, you know, within three weeks, right? So I want to showcase to everyone that if you do all of these things, right, and you really model what Aaron's doing, you can have this level of success, right? And we have an abundance of leads coming in, right? It's a matter of just going deep like she did with all of these leads, right? From not just putting someone on a property search and waiting for them to tell you, like she's handpicking properties and working with the client to identify which properties they want to see, right? It's, there's a lot of little things. So this will be recorded. Um, yes, and go back and watch this, but take notes, guys, model this behavior and you'll be the next one getting a $4 million property and contract within three weeks of receiving the lead. Let's go. Thank you. <laughs> All right, um, we got a couple minutes, guys. Let's maybe take the last five minutes for any questions, comments, feedback. Anybody have any questions for Aaron, right? No question is a dumb question. So feel free to put it in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself if you have any questions for her. Good job, Aaron. Keep hustling. Gracias. <laughs> All right, guys, if that's all we got, is there any, oh, here we go. Is there anything in particular from your banking job that you find yourself utilizing? That's a good question, because she was in banking for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Honestly, it comes up a lot. I think as an agent, you guys should be like well-rounded with your knowledge, whether it's on like the financing side, um, especially right now with the market being down, there's, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, I'm going to put my hold on search for various reasons, but there's, there's certain like workarounds for people getting their down payment without having to pull out the market, but just being able to, uh, even like with contractors or how much remodeling is going to cost, like being able to give your clients like ballpark amounts, um, and just being able to solve like problems off the top of your head. Um, I think that's important, but yeah, I think a lot of my banking background is useful here. <laughs> Um, I think in, with a lot of my clients, it's, it's helpful just with the finances um, or like the investment side. <clears throat> like with the market being down right now, um, you can do like a securities-based loan. So it's like a loan off of your investment. So you don't have to pull it out and it's a low interest rate. Um, and, you know, if, if they're looking for their down payment, they, the, some banks will do just a soft check, but it doesn't show up on your uh, DTI. Um, so if your clients have, problems pulling out of the market for the down payment amount, as long as they have enough in investments and they can, they can do the, the securities based loan. It's, it's an option for them. They just have to check to make sure that whatever financial institution they're with doesn't, um, doesn't report it to their credit. That's a big one. The little things like there that. You go. You That's a huge, huge mm -hmm. tip right That's a huge tip right there, right? Um, a lot of people, especially high net worth people, they have money tied up in investments, stocks, securities and stuff like that to where they might have a few million dollars in, in their investments and they need, they need to pull out 500,000 for their deposit. So they can, you know, do a securities loan. Basically their whole investment is their collateral and I get access to that money for their down payment. So 
like she said, having, having that well-rounded knowledge, and that's what we talked about in the beginning of knowing some of the lending stuff, right? So if you're an agent and you don't know how lending works, you need to do some training on lending. You need to get understand the basics of what's available, knowing, you know, the process of remodeling, knowing how much ballpark, you know, things will cost for the most common things, flooring, kitchen, painting, landscaping, all those things. Like that's really, really powerful. And then I think also Aaron's just because Aaron has had so much experience dealing with clients, she has a level of confidence, right? When she speaks to people, she doesn't sound like she's second guessing herself or fumbling, you know? So that's also comes with time of just dealing with a lot of clients where you build that confidence and not be intimidated by a $4 million buyer, right? Because if someone sees you as intimidated, you know, they're not going to feel confident in you leading them to the finish line. Right. You know, so, and she's shown that right by her just demonstrating that she's not just after the paycheck, she was doing things to figure out really what their needs were. So um, good stuff, guys. This is all I got for you guys. I hope you guys got some value today. Um, hit up Aaron, pick her brain. I know Aaron's always willing to help. So if you guys have any other questions offline, feel free to, uh, to message Aaron. And, you know, I know she's going to continue to be successful. Thank you. All right, guys. We'll see you next week.